Okay, itak pochnayemo. Welcome Vitayemo to Osredok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center's lecture, Shevchenko the Artist, with subject expert Yudmila Pokoryelova. This event will take place in English with the opportunity to ask questions in either English or Ukrainian. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alexandra Shkandri, the curator of exhibits here at Osredok, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator this evening. Vitaimo vas na tiu podiu osredka z Ljudmiliju Pogorjelovoju. Ja, Oleksandra Škandri, kurator vestovok tut posredku, in neni večerom budu pervodite vaši pitanja pani Pogorjelovi. Mi hotili počati z viznanja toho, što zemlja, na kotri vidbovajte tja podija, virtualno, Vinnipeh, je tradicijna teritorija bahatjoh naciju, vključno z Anišinabe, Inivak a Nishnevak Dakota, Dene e i Meti Ljudme. Me takož veznajemo, šo Vinipeh pipadaje pid diju dohovore od noho. Osredok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center is located on Treaty 1 territory, the original lands and waters of Anishinaabe, Inuak, Anishnewak, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Metis Nation. Dla tih, kotri ne znajome iz osredkom ukrajinskoj kulturi i osvite, me riznomenitna organizacija tud v centri Vinipeha. Osredok muzej, kartina galereja, arhiv i biblioteka. Osredok takož hromadjanski kulturni centr, v kotromu provedeni podiji, kurse ta kulturni programe. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Osredok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center, we're a multifaceted organization located in the heart of Winnipeg. Osredok serves as a museum, art gallery, archive, library, as well as a community center and cultural hub. Programming in Osredok includes various workshops, educational courses, and events like tonight's lecture. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Yudmila Pogoryelova. Pani Pogoryelova is a director of the Taras Shevchenko Museum in Toronto, Ontario. She graduated from the Odessa Pedagogical University in 1993 and immigrated to Canada in 2000. She began working at the Taras Shevchenko Museum shortly after in 2003 and has been there since. In her time at Taras Shevchenko Museum, Ms. Pogoryelova has curated over 40 exhibitions as well as conducted numerous lectures, concerts, presentations and other public events. Welcome Ivitayamovas. Thank you so much. Uh, I am certainly not an expert, but I like Shevchenko and I, um, I am fascinated by his poetry and art. And uh, it was it is with great pleasure that I will take you to that journey uh, of his artistic creations. Uh, the world knows and honors Shevchenko as a poet. Um, philosopher, founder of the Ukrainian literary language, fighter for people's freedoms and rights, but not everyone knows that uh, he was uh, actually a very accomplished artist. Yet over his relatively short life, Shevchenko created almost 1200 oil paintings, watercolors, CPS, pen and ink and pencil drawings, as well as etchings. 835 works have survived to our time, but more than 270 are considered lost or still unfound. Uh, his portraits, compositions on mythological and historical themes, landscapes, and drawings uh, of historical landmarks span the period from 1830 till uh, 1861 and uh, are mainly connected with Ukraine, Russia, and Kazakhstan. His art uh, falls into three periods, early and academic works, it's uh, from 1830 to 1847, uh, years of exile, 1847 till 1857, and post-exile, 1857-1861. Olga Shevchenko trained as an academic artist in St. Petersburg. He eventually moved toward uh, portraying daily life. Couched in these works were often social commentary and criticism of Tsarist domination and subjugation. At this point, 
I will um, share my screen. Here's a presentation. And we will start the slideshow. It doesn't allow me to start from the from the first slide. Well, let me share it again. Let me share it again. Hmm. Um, it doesn't allow to show the slideshow. That's a thing. <clears throat> Okay, share my screen. Finally. <clears throat> Taras Shevchenko was born on March 9, 1814 in the village of Morency, some 200 kilometers south of Kiev into a family of serfs on the estate of Baron Vasily Engelhard. Being a serf meant that he, his parents, and five siblings were nothing more than possessions of their master. As a child, he was deeply in love with painting and drawing. Chalk and charcoal were a great joy for the boy, and he used them to draw everywhere, outdoors in nature, and when indoors, on walls, benches, tables, everywhere. And he liked to depict birds, animals, and people. In a poem written many years later, in 1847, he reflects on that early period of life with this poetry. Куплю паперу аркуш і зроблю маленьку книжечку хрестами і візерунками з квітками, кругом листочки обведу та й списую сковороду. It was uh, the poetry, it was a poem um, to uh, Andrei Kozach Kozachkivsky, 1847. Orphaned uh, at the age of 11, uh, Taras goes to the surrounding villages in search of an art teacher and finally finds a painter in the village of Hlipnivka who agrees to teach him. However, when the painter asks permission from Taras's master to do so, Engelhardt refuses. Instead, recogni instead, recognizing the boy's talent, he takes him, him into the house as a servant boy. Uh, the earliest significant influence um, on the future artist was Ukrainian life, um, nature and um, uh, and folk art, uh, such as embroidery, icons, ornamentation, and songs, as well as lupki. Lupki were um, the popular pictures with captions representing characters in scenes of everyday life. Taras Shevchenko collected them and uh, copied them. In 1829, Engelgard leaves for Vilna, Lithuania, taking Taras with him. 
It is assumed that during this period of life, Shevchenko took drawing lessons from Jan Rustem, a professor of painting. Shevchenko's first known work, Portrait of a Woman, belongs to the Vilna period. It is not his original composition, but a copy from the lithography of an unknown engraver. The masterful capturing of line and texture speak to the undeniable talent of the young artist, who was at the time only 16 years old. In 1831, taking Shevchenko with him, Engelhardt moves to St. Petersburg, capital of Russian Empire. In St. Petersburg, Shevchenko's life changed dramatically. Engelhardt, recognizing the talent of Shevchenko and hoping to turn him into his own personal artist, contracts the boy to decorative artist Vasily Shiraev at, as an apprentice in 1832. Shiraev was a businessman, and he was, by the way, a former serf as well. The Shiraev firm took on commissions for interior design and decoration of private and public premises. They did everything from painting fences to painting theaters. Together with other artists, Taras participates in the painting of Senate and Synod, which were buildings of state bodies of government built in the style of late classicism. And he is engaged in decorating the Bolshoi and Alexandrisky theaters. In fact, uh, he also decorated uh, Mikhailovsky theater. In his role, Shevchenko gains not only the experience of a master, craft, uh, a master craftsman, but also the skills of a fine artist. Shiraev taught his students painting and drawing, in particular, drawing mythological and historical figures. Uh, Taras Shevchenko later uh, recalled that there were copies of Raphael engravings in the Shiraev studio and all the students could use them. As Taras's skills evolve, Shiraev encourages his efforts in trusting him with ever more important jobs. Participation in the decoration of churches and luxurious buildings, visits to the Hermitage and the sites of St. Petersburg all serve as a university for the young artist. And in his six years of apprenticeship, Shevchenko gradually becomes more skilled in composition and portraiture. At the same time, he dreams of freedom as one by one, his fellow apprentices gain, are gaining theirs. The earliest known of Shevchenko's watercolors is a portrait miniature of Engelhardt, who is depicted wearing a dark brown frock coat, a light blue vest, his neck covered with a purple scarf, his expression revealing his character. A major turning point in Shevchenko's life is when he meets a student of the St. Petersburg Imperial Academy of Arts, Ivan Soshenko, who, believing in Taras's talent, introduces him to a circle of famous artists and writers, including Yevhen Hribinka, Vasily Grigorovich, and Alexei Venetsyanov. It is through these people that Shevchenko meets artist Karl Burlov, poet Vasily Zhukovsky, and composer Mikhail Velgorsky, the group of intellectuals who eventually organized Shevchenko's release from serfdom. At this lithograph by Borisenko, 
the first meeting between Shevchenko and Soshenko is depicted in the St. Petersburg, Saint Petersburg um, summer garden. However, according to uh, Ivan Soshenko's correspondence, a letter to a friend, he mentioned that the first meeting uh, with Shevchenko happened actually at uh, Ivan Soshenko apartment in St. Petersburg. Even before he is released from serfdom, Shevchenko attends art classes in the Society for the Encouragement of Artists, where he develops his mastery of drawing and composition. During 1835 till 1837, he makes a series of drawings on typical academic subjects. Here we see the works of that period death of Virginia, and also the next one, death of Socrates. These works attest to his creative and technical development. He learns the principles of figure drawing, proportion, movement, and composition. He also addresses Ukrainian themes as evidenced in uh, death of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. He did it in 1837. While diligently working on the basics of academic art in drawing class, Shevchenko continues to improve his skills as a portraitist in watercolors. No one taught him portraiture yet. He did it on his own independently by studying the works of other artists, particularly by Ivan Sokolov. You can see three portraits of his friends. Those are very, very early watercolor portraits. On April 22, 1838, Shevchenko is brought out of serfdom by his friends and prominent figures of Russian and Ukrainian culture who believed Shevchenko to be a gifted artist. The price of Shevchenko's freedom was Karl Brilov's portrait of Vasily Zhukovsky, which was ruffled off in a lottery. By the way, Engelhardt asked for Taras Shevchenko's freedom, very, very high amount of money, high price. It was 2,500 rubles, which was at that time enormously, very, very much money. In May 1838, Shevchenko enrolls in the St. Petersburg Academy of Arts on a scholarship awarded him by the Society for the Encouragement of Artists. Finally, a long awaited and so desired freedom. I can't believe it myself now. From a dirty attic, I flew on wings to the magic halls of the Academy of Arts, writes Taras Shevchenko. Taras Shevchenko becomes one of Karl Brilov's favorite students. Under his influence, Shevchenko perfectly masters the technique of drawing and he absorbs Brilov's style. Brilov's favorite color was red and Shevchenko excitedly uses red in his paintings of the academic period. For example, a woman in bed and the other one is Odelisk. These works indicate the strong influence of Brilov's style. Shevchenko also made a copy of Karl Brilov's watercolor Interrupted Rendezvous. In 1840, Shevchenko creates his first oil painting, nude in the pose of Saint, Saint Sebastian. During his studies at the academy, Shevchenko attends lectures on physiology, physics, zoology, studies French, reads history books, 
translations of Homer, Schiller, and Goethe. This academic training gave Shevchenko a high proficiency in drawing, brilliant knowledge of anatomy, and mastery of, of composition. In early 1840, Shevchenko creates a self-portrait, which becomes the first in a gallery of almost 40 self-portraits. This work, marked by a high professional level, attests to his mastery of the technique of oil painting. This is a romantic image of a 26 years old man. The eyes gaze at the viewer from a deep shadow, giving the impression that one can see into the intimate world of the artist's thoughts. With his self-portrait of 1840, Shevchenko declares himself as a romantic artist. In a letter to his brother, Shevchenko will write, I live and study. I don't bow to anyone, and I am not afraid of anyone except of God. What a happiness to be a free man. While studying at the Academy of Arts, Shevchenko is awarded three silver medals. His third silver medal was received for the painting The Gypsy Fortune Teller. It's in watercolor. In this first genre work based on an original subject, certain features of romanticism begin to appear. We see a scene of everyday life in which the artist idealizes the beautiful, young, well-dressed maiden, contrasting her with the older, impoverished fortune teller. This ideal of the dark-browed Ukrainian female beauty is an image to which Shevchenko will keep returning. You will see in his later works, you will see that same type of the face. And by the way, in many of his other genre works, you will see a little doggy here. Shevchenko liked animals. During um, this period uh, of time, Shevchenko lost the financial support of the academy, so he paints commissioned portraits. He also creates a number of illustrations for literary works, including uh, Hiller, it's on Kvitka Osnovyanenko, a Catholic monk, it's on the literary work by Nadezhdin, and a blind woman with her daughter. It is based on his own um, poem, and it's uh, just to name a few. One of the most famous paintings of the artist, Katarina, was created while studying at the academy. This complex work is of both genre and allegorical form. In the painting, inspired by his own memories of Ukraine and by his poem Katerina, Shevchenko idealizes the young Ukrainian maiden. He depicts his central female figure as though she were Venus or the Madonna a figure widely used in religious and allegorical paintings. In the spring of 1843, after a 14 year um, absence, Taras Shevchenko travels to Ukraine. He had left Ukraine as a servant boy and was now returning as a famous poet and artist. In this new environment, his imagery changes. If we compare Katerina created at the academy and a peasant family created uh, in Ukraine, the difference is immediately noticeable. When traveling through his native land, he seems to exchange a certain academic coldness and stiffness for warmth and simplicity. This is a different style of painting 
with smooth, soft modeling and warm and muted light. The artist's pictorial style seems to become smoother and softer as in Dutch painting. The painting peasant family employs the classic Western European motif of the Holy Family, the mood of the painting filled with tenderness and joy. Uh, in his self-portrait of 1840, we see that artist begins using light as a means of, uh, a means of self-expression. He continues to experiment with light in the oil portraits created in the middle 1840s. Here, he searches by applying various highlights and shadows, either completely shading the right part of the face and illuminating the left, as we can see in the portrait of Alexander Lukyanovich, or by applying a soft light on the upper half of the face and shading the lower half, as seen in the portraits of Josip Rudnitz, Rudzinski and Pantele Monkulish. These portraits are less about accuracy of representation and more about intimacy, mood, character, and thoughts. It should be noted that among his subjects, no one is indifferent to Shevchenko nor hostile to him. And the artist in his turn took commissions only when portraying those for whom he had sympathy and affection. And he did it, he did so without any idealization of his subjects. Later in 1844, Shevchenko also painted a double portrait of the grandchildren of Prince Repnin, Varvara and Vasilko. Here he expressively conveys the mood and individual characteristics of both children. Especially striking is the childishly serious look of Vasilko and the dreamy look of charming Varya. Children tended to like Taras Shevchenko. The artist himself said, if children like me, then I'm not a bad person. In 1843, during his stay in Ukraine, Shevchenko is so taken with his general experiences and surroundings that he decides to create a series of etchings called Pictures of Ukraine and to use the proceeds from the sale to buy his siblings out of serfdom. In 1844, he begins working on the album, which was supposed to be released quarterly with three etchings per issue. However, only two issues, six etchings, were published. Uh, here on the screen, there are two out of six. And here are other four. Um, four out of six were accompanied by texts. Throughout the etchings in picturesque Ukraine, Shevchenko consistently uses the play of illumination and shadows to create contrast, emphasis, mood, and atmosphere, as we see in the matchmaking ritual here on the bottom right. Um, and uh, in the depiction of ambassadors in gifts of Chihirin here on the bottom left. Uh, this gift of Chihirin um, uh, uh, is accompanied by the text. It's 1649. It's a lot of uh, lots of um, uh, of people in one room and all these ambassadors came with their presents. Uh, and the presents are lit very well. In Vedubichi Monastery, here on the uh, upper right part of the screen, the artist depicts one of the oldest churches in Kiev. 
in whole series pictures Ukraine. Shevchenko romanticizes Ukraine. Its historical and spiritual memory, its nature and everyday life, its customs and spirits. Unfortunately, because the sales of the sale of the first issue of Pictures Ukraine was too slow, Shevchenko was unable to raise the funds to publish the second collection of etchings. Sadly, his dream of securing freedom for his brothers and sisters never came true. In 1845, Shevchenko graduates from the academy where he is awarded the title of artist in historical and portrait painting. He immediately returns to Ukraine where he begins working for the Archaeographic Commission. In this period, he travels uh, through the regions of Kiev, Poltava, Chernihiv, Podilia, and Volyn, drawing and describing historical and architectural monuments and collecting folk songs and legends. With these watercolors and sepias, in the departure from the style of the academic studio and free of idealization, Shevchenko conveys the feelings of lightness and airness. I will stop talking for a moment and show you these beautiful pictures of this period of life. Ascold Mausoleum. So detailed. During these travels, Shevchenko becomes one of the most famous and popular portrait artists of his time. His subjects come from all sections of society, ranging from simple peasants to prominent Ukrainian and Russian cultural figures, members of former Cossack Starshina families, and even members of the imperial nobility. On April 17, 1847, Taras Shevchenko is arrested for his revolutionary poems and participation in the secret radical Cyril and Methodius Brotherhood. He is sentenced and exiled to serve as a private in a Far East military outpost in the Orenburg steppes. Approving the verdict, Tsar Nicholas I added with his own hand under strictest surveillance with the prohibition to write and paint. In Orsk Fortress, Shevchenko draws a self-portrait in a soldier, soldier's uniform and cap. On the band of the cap, we see the inscription 3R. Taras Shevchenko served in the third company of the fifth line battalion of the Orenburg Separate Corps. This is his first drawing of the exile period. In a letter to his friend, Andriy Lizohov, he writes, I suffer terribly because I am forbidden to write and draw. And nights, nights, God, how terrible and long and in the barracks. At this point, he asks to send him a sketchbook with paints, a blank album, and at least one brush. When the artist receives the supplies, he replies to Lisa Hu, I still can't come to my senses. I didn't sleep all night. I looked and looked at it, turning it over, kissing every paint three times and how not to kiss it, not seeing it for a whole year. 
at the beginning of 1848, Russian scientist Lieutenant Commander Alexei Butakov, who had a favorable attitude toward Shevchenko, included him in his massive Aral Sea expedition, which was organized by the Ministry of Defense. The purpose of this expedition was to study natural resources and draw maps for the possibility of Aral Sea navigation and shipping. I show this map here because, um, sorry, I didn't find it in, in English, but I just wanted to show that St. Petersburg is over here and Shevchenko was exiled first to Orenburg here and then to Ors over here. Uh, and that expedition, the Aral Sea expedition that was organized um, by uh, the Ministry of Defense was to, um, uh, to research Aral Sea, which is this little, little thing. Um, it's like a, a little lake, but uh, the water is salty. So it's a, a, it's a sea, Aral Sea. So the expedition, the massive expedition had to, um, to cut to, they arrived to Ors and they had to, walk all uh, all the way here to Aral Sea. Um, the expedition has hundreds of people, including researchers, technicians, uh, security guards, um, carriers. Uh, they had uh, camels and horses. They even transported two boats, two schooners in parts, of course. They had a cannon with them because, uh, because of, of the security. So Shevchenko still um, was, not able, was not allowed to draw and to write. And that's why on paper, Shevchenko was officially enlisted as a security guard, but unofficially and illegally as an artist. Taras Shevchenko's talent flourishes in his new in his in his drawings of that Aral Sea coast and nearly and newly discovered island, islands. In incredibly difficult and hostile conditions of ex exile, he secretly manages to produce over 300 watercolors, sepias, and pencil drawings, 120 of which have survived till our, day, our time. Most of the compositions of this period are done as horizontal landscapes with wide open horizon. A special feature of these drawings is a combination of topographical accuracy and expressive emotional coloring. In this austere environment, Shevchenko was able to, depict, to find and depict pure beauty. During the expedition, Shevchenko makes a self-portrait. It's 1850. This is sepia. He depicts himself in civilian clothes, wearing a light coat from under which we can see a white shirt with an open collar and a white cap. His face glows with inner peace. This was a period of his life when Shevchenko felt relatively free. After all, he did not have to live in the barracks and he had a freedom to draw. On April 23, 1850, Shevchenko is denounced for writing and drawing and sent to the Novopetrovsk Novo fortification, located on the eastern coast of the Caspian Sea on the Mangishlak Peninsula. Here he suffers seven years of severe physical and moral torment. So here from Orsk, he was sent right here where Fort Shevchenko is here. Fort Shevchenko is uh, the, um, uh, the later name of Novopetrovsk fortification. 
so it's it's far further east in the spring of 1851, Shevchenko has a good fortune to participate in yet another scientific expedition. This one is an exploration of coal deposits in the Karatau Mountains. After a long period of creative inactivity, in conditions of seemingly complete hopelessness, this door to another world is suddenly opened for Shevchenko. In a letter to his friend, Shevchenko writes that his environment is a desert, an absolute desert without any vegetation, just sand and stone. And the poorest inhabitants are Roman nomadic Kyrgyz people. But from this barren nature, the artist is able to extract rich artistic material and develop a new, new creative vision. Shevchenko reveals great empathy for the life of the local inhabitants. In a letter to Princess Varvara Ripnina, he writes, the Kyrgyz people are so picturesque, so original, that it's hard not to depict them in drawings. Here we see an expression of emotional sensitivity combined with social commentary. Shevchenko often uses sepia, but especially during the period of exile. Sepia, as you might know, is a rich brown pigment from uh, the ink sac of the cattle fish. Here we see how masterfully he uses the transparency of sepia to convey gradations of color. This sepia depicts a young Kazakh maiden, her lamp illuminating the ornamented Ornament, ornamented tombstone. Her face and shoulders are based in a soft glow, giving the impression of a special aura and mystery. In exile, the artist begins to develop a series of drawings called the Parable of the Prodigal Son. The first five drawings describe one man's path from drunkenness through gambling to robbery and murder and consequent punishment. In basing the series on a parable from the Gospels, Shevchenko is commenting, commenting on the immoral choices sometimes made in life. Even though he bases this uh, uh, series on the gospel, and we know that in the original gospel, uh, the um, prodigal son is forgiven by his father. Um, but uh, here in Shevchenko's series, uh, there is no forgiveness. In 1857, with Shevchenko's release from service, a, punishment decade, a punishing decade of misery, humiliation, and military drill comes to an end. He has aged, turned gray, and lost his health, as evidenced in his self-portrait of 1858. However, restrictions are still imposed upon him. Forbidden to live and to live in the capital of the empire, he lives for some time in Astrakhan and Nizhny Novgorod. Here is Blahovishinsky Cathedral in Nizhny Novgorod. During this period, he creates a number of portraits of his friends and commissioned portraits. Drawing in Italian black and white pencil, these works are compositionally perfect. Portrait of Shevkin is one of the best portraits that Shevchenko made. 
Using only two colors, the artist expressively conveys both simplicity and sophistication. Shepkin was, uh, was Shevchenko's very, very good friend. In the second portrait, we see the image of Mikhailo Lazarevsky, a very close and much loved friend who helped the artist tremendously throughout his lifetime. After the Shevchenko's death, Lazarevsky also took care of the funeral. On July 2nd, 1857, Shevchenko wrote in his diary, send O Lord to all people such a friend as Lazarevsky. Next two portraits uh, are portraits of men and wife, Mikhailo and Maria, Marie Maximovich. Mikhailo Maximovich was a rector of the Kiev University. Um, Maria Maximovich was very, very kind to Shevchenko. When Shevchenko looked for a, a future wife, uh, he, he wrote to his brother, he says, oh, please find me a woman like Maria. He also makes a portrait of Ira Aldrich, the African-American tra tragic actor whom Shevchenko met in 1858 in St. Petersburg, while the actor was on tour and with whom Shevchenko developed a very close friendship. In black and white pencil, the artist creates a powerful contrast of surfaces. Uh, it is only black and white pencil uh, and the actor is, uh, has black skin. How masterfully, uh, with only two colors, black and white, Shevchenko uh, depicts his, uh, his face, amazing. At the end of May, 1859, Shevchenko finally receives permission to visit Ukraine. During his brief stay in Ukraine, in his native land, he creates an entire collection of works. They all are simple, laconic, and brilliantly executed. The pictures made in pen and ink, sepia and pencil, were included in an album which has not survived in its entirety. Only 13 pages, have come down to our time. In Lichvin, where Shevchenko visited his friend, and these two in Cherkasy and near Kanyev, they are simple, brilliant, and very, very nice. At this stage of his life, Shevchenko becomes taken with the idea of engraving as a means to demo democratizing art with, without sacrificing the aesthetics. In his diary, Shevchenko writes, I am considering devoting myself entirely to aquatint engraving. Of all the fine arts, I now like engraving the most and for good reason. To be a good engraver means to be a disseminator of what is beautiful and educational. It means to be a propagator of the light of truth. It means to be useful to people and to God. The most beautiful and noble vocation is the vocation of an engraver. These first two aquatint etchings created after exile where two girls after his own painting and holy family after a painting by the Spanish artist Murillo. This new technique of making art was indeed challenging and not an easy task, yet Shevchenko persisted, eventually mastering his craft. At this time, Shevchenko um, was was very, was very much fascinated by Rembrandt. And Rembrandt, of course, is uh, uh, well known um, and honored for his ability to 
uh, depict lights, lights and shadows. Uh, at this time, Shevchenko copies a lot of his uh, works, Rembrandt works, uh, and uh, he decided to do an aquatine etchings after um, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So he first copies Rembrandt's uh, work in sepia, and then he creates an etching in, in aqua tint, uh, which is done extremely well. In the spring of 1859, Shevchenko creates Old Man at the Cemetery, a sepia, uh, his own um, sepia here on the left, which he then produces as an aqua tint by means of oblique and curved lines that seems to intersect randomly, the artist perfectly conveys the illusion of light. The next one will be Friends that Shevchenko did in Aquatint, uh, Aquatint after the painting by Ivan Sokolov, Priyateli, Friends. Despite the early challenges of teaching himself these new techniques, with each new work, Shevchenko's skills as an engraver improves. Lines on etchings become easier and more dynamic, and the use of aqua tint softens the overall tone. At the academic exhibition of 1860, Taras Shevchenko submits five etchings together with an application to be awarded the title of academician engraver. This too, the left one is based on his own painting. The right one is painted uh, on the painting by Meshersky, Oak. Evening in, Al in Albano evening in Albano. Uh, it is from the painting by Lebedev. So first Shevchenko copies the painting and then he does aqua tint after that. Bathsheba from Brilov's painting and uh, his own self-portrait with a candle. In recognition of his mastery on September 2, 1860, the Council of the Academy of Arts awards Shevchenko the title of Academician of Engraving. He continues working on etchings under his final days, until his final days, producing portraits of outstanding cultural figures such as sculptors Fyodor Tolstoy and Pet, Pet, uh, Potter Claude, artists Bruni and architect Ivan Hornostaev. Taras Shevchenko also made his self-portrait in a, a coat and um, hat, fur coat, coat and hat. Taras Shevchenko's technical achievements in etchings were widely publicized and in the press, uh, he, was, he was awarded of, uh, he was lo lauded for his high level of artistic skills. Here I want to mention that um, in 1860, uh, Shevchenko eagerly wanted to get married and settle somewhere in Ukraine. He asked his brother to purchase, uh, uh, on behalf of him, to purchase a piece of land in the village of Pekarev near Kanyev. And uh, Shevchenko started to dream about his own house uh, he, he wanted finally to settle in Ukraine somewhere close to Dnieper River, getting married and have start family. Uh, he painted these um, um, drawings of his future house. 
uh, not only did he do that, but he also uh, produced an ar architectural plan for, um, for every room, altogether six um, drawings. Uh, here I show only one. It's where which room will be where and where he will work, where he will um, be resting and kitchen and everything else. This is one of six. This pencil portrait dates back to the time of Shevchenko's acquaintance with Likera, his last love, Likera Polosmak. It is full of grace and admiration for the woman he sincerely loved. From January 1861, the artist almost never leaves his cold apartment, an attic in the building of the Imperial Academy of Arts. In this room, he creates his final self-portrait. Painted in dark tones, the artist depict, depicts his fatigue and ailing self in sheepskin coat and fur hat. The overall mood is haunting and somber. His highlighted face conveying pain and hopelessness. In conclusion, I would like to say that Taras Shevchenko's art is an outstanding phenomenon in the history of Ukrainian fine art. A truly innovative and dedicated artist, despite the prohibition to write and draw, he always managed to create even under the worst of conditions. He preserved as an artist because creativity was his life. Thank you very much for your attention. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. We uh, don't have a lot of time, but I do have a question here. So um, I'm just going to open up the floor. Um, if people do have questions, they can either type them in the Q&A um, or they can raise their hand. Um, the first question here is, um, the Capitania, Shot Tomuroti, Viplanuite, Dodnian, Rogina Tarasa, Shevchenka. My planuimo Zrobiti at a key event on March Yamoju po Ukrainski Pitania, po Ukrainski Bulotak. My budemo Robiti at a key, um, um, uh, gala event. Um, it will be like an open door event uh, where we want to present uh, Shevchenko art, Shevchenko poetry, and the building. It was recently renovated uh, building, and we wanted to uh, show the community that uh, this building exists and it's open for um, meetings, lectures, presentations for private events, and we of course want to highlight to whom this uh, this museum is devoted. So March nine. Thank you. So everyone, you can if you're in the Toronto area, please join Pani Ludmila. Um, another question that we have, um, and this is something that I was thinking about a lot, and it says it's here from um, Marina. It says, I am so impressed with Shevchenko's art and I'm curious why he's not well known here and in Western Europe. Um, Pani Ludmila, could you talk to a little bit about this? Because he's so much better known as both a poet and as a, a nationalist figure in Ukraine. Uh, that's very true. Maybe, maybe that's why he is not very well known as an artist because his poetry kind of like illum illuminated his uh, his uh, um, uh, his uh, spatula, his uh, what what he what he uh, left us is poetry and and uh, the the poetry is absolutely international and speaks to everybody. Uh, while we recognize that uh, there is no uh, no one like Shevchenko in the Ukrainian um, uh, poetry and, and prose, 
uh, there are many others who were also artists. So what I'm trying to say that even though he was an outstanding artist, he is still considered to be not the very big star as an artist because he was a real star in poetry. By the way, um, because he spent 10 years in exile being in Kazakhstan uh, and Kazakhstan at that time uh, was not Kazakhstan. Even, even you might have noticed that uh, uh, I always refer to local people as Kyrgyz because uh, they started to be na named or called Kazakhs only after 1925. So uh, Kazakh people actually consider Shevchenko as, his, as their first national artist. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> Because he was the very first who depicted uh, their land. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, one other question that I wanted to to bring up for you is, um, and it sort of feeds into this as well, is that he seems to be um, really interested in themes of social justice, of um, truth, of uh, really depicting real life for people who don't typically get depicted in this era. Uh, why do you think he's so interested in that theme? Uh, he was very brave to do so. Uh, at that time, um, in both poetry and art, it was mostly, I like, um, the, the, the poetry and art were supposed to elevate spirit, it, spirits, it was all um, depicted not nicer than it was in reality. It was like more idealism. And Shevchenko um, uh, was a realistic art uh, artist. He did, he did, he depicted uh, re real life. Uh, it was not very popular. Uh, we know that art, art is something very beautiful, uh, but when you try to depict even ugly things in life, you are very brave. Uh, he, he especially was, ve was very much concerned about uh, the attitude towards women at that time. He was a champion of all oppressed people, everybody who, who um, did not have a chance to be born in, uh, and raised in the wealthy family. People worked and had nothing. Other people did not work and had everything. And this injustice from the very childhood was um, a, a very, very bold um, uh, point in his uh, in his life. Even even when his father was alive, he took him once uh, to Chumakuvate. Uh, the, the the group of villagers went to throughout all Ukraine. They went to for for salt, and on on his war on his um, road, Shevchenko always saw um, lots of people, poor people who work, and uh, some people who do not work and were very nicely presented. So that injustice. Um, was uh, uh, is a very important moment in his art and poetry, uh, and uh, he um, he actually could have lived very very well by not touching these subjects, because he was a very good artist. Photography did not exist at that time. People paid a lot of money for portraits. Um, but he decided that since he gets his talent to draw and to write poetry, he could help his people to get freedom. He could, he could um, maybe move uh, his people for realizing that uh, the life, life should be more, uh, should be better for them. Because, because they deserve. Um, yeah, he, he was very brave to get this social uh, and political uh, element in his poetry and art, very brave. And it seems that he paid quite a high price for that as well. 
very high price mm -hmm. when uh, when the members of uh, Cyril and Methodius society were arrested all of them were arrested but it's only Shevchenko who received the very very cruel punishment that maybe the the worst punishment but the creative person um, not to allow him to write and to draw it's the worst punishment ever And it's for this reason that we're so thankful to have had you talk a little bit more about this aspect of his work. Um, the reason that we're doing this lecture tonight is um, at Osoradok, we're currently featuring some of his works and um, a, a large portion of these works that are on display in our immersive exhibition. Um, they are from the Shevchenko Museum in Kanyiv. And, um, you know, they were... They survived um, from Shevchenko's time. They survived, you know, the First World War, the Second World War, and now in this conflict as well, they've been returned to the exact same crates that they um, were shielded from the front, the Nazi front, in 1941. And so um, we're very grateful that you know we're able to um, have this opportunity to speak with you and to sort of have this, this chance to talk a little bit more about Shevchenko's artworks and bring him to a wider public for so many of us who don't know so much about him. So yeah. thank you. He deserves, he, he deserves to be more known, more known. Uh, it is maybe worthwhile to mention that Shevchenko as no one uh, other historical figure has, has that many monument, mo monuments to him. It's over 1,600. Um, it's incredible um, how many Shakespeare uh, uh, does maybe few, <laughs> but Shevchenko is everywhere, everywhere. And thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you everyone who joined us tonight. And um, do you have any other comments that you wanna leave us on, Pani Lyudmila? Thank you for being here. Uh, I just I, I just want to, to wish you very, um, um, to wish you, success in your exhibition, immersive exhibition. Uh, I've been in Osiradu a few times. It's, uh, it's amazing, uh, amazing things what you do. And uh, I just hope for the future collaboration with you and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you so much. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you much. much. Good night. Do